Hi everyone, um, welcome to tonight's um, ArcSoft live talk. Um, tonight we have Dr. Jeremy Dewar from the University of Toronto. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, if, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them, them in the chat on the side. We will be answering questions afterwards. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, over, over to you, <laughs> Jeremy. Okay, well, first I'd like to say thank you for everyone for coming. I really appreciate your time. I know everyone's quite busy these days. And I want to first apologize for the horrendous title I submitted. Um, it's really awkward and ungainly, and so I'm going to change it a bit. So right now it says, Using Geochemistry to Contextualize Human Social and Technological Innovation in Southern Africa During the Pleistocene, Evidence from the Drylands and Highlands. Um, but I, I hope to improve on that in the next slide. But I did want to take this opportunity to uh, recognize that um, the results of the research I'll be talking about today, while a lot of it does come from my team at the University of Toronto, um, in fact, um, we have a long-standing collaboration with Brian Stewart at the University of Michigan, as well as at the Archaeometry Lab at the University of Cape Town with Judy Seeley. Um, and, pa and Petrus LaRue, um, also at ECT. Uh, we also work with the Rock Art Research Institute, and some of the hypotheses I'll present are from um, Peter Mitchell at the University of Oxford. So I just wanted to acknowledge that the results I'm presenting are really um, from a lot of people working together. Okay, so you'll also have to bear with me. I can't see anybody, so I've just assumed that um, Everything's going along well. So really what I should have called this uh, ARCSOC title, um, it should have been Modern Human Innovation and the Importance of Ostrich Egg Shell in Southern Africa. So for this talk, I will introduce um, our major research project, MEMSA. Then I'm gonna talk about how we use ostrich egg shell in different regions of where we work to answer important questions. Um, Questions like radiocarbon dating, how old is the deposits? Um, we have preliminary results that look at paleoenvironmental proxy data for vegetation, aridity, and relative humidity. Although today I'll just really focus on the biometrics and the carbon preliminary results. Um, and I'll also talk about how we use strontium isotopes to try and look for evidence of mobility and trade in the different regions that we work in. But fundamentally, I hope that you come away from this lecture um, with an understanding of how important ostrich eggshell was in um, being available to create these technological and cultural innovations. And so I'm speaking primarily of the fact that um, we have evidence of ostrich eggshell flasks at 70,000 years ago at Apollo 11. And today I'll uh, share with you some research on social innovations using ostrich egg shell beads um, to show social networks by at least 33,000 years ago at Sahong Hong. Um, so hopefully together um, I will keep you interested in this talk. Okay, so to start talking a bit about AMEMSA, or the research project that Brian Stewart and I co-direct, it really came out of a range of recent data that showed that human dispersals of modern humans out of Africa um, and into the old world happened at a remarkably rapid rate. In fact, uh, it looks like people migrated out of from the Horn of Africa all the way down the Southern Arc into Australia by at least 30,000 and maybe even within 10,000 years. Now they did this with an, a remarkable competency and ability to move into completely new environments um, and colonize those regions, which we really don't see the, uh, our ancestral hominins doing to the same degree. Um, and so we predict that uh, Homo sapiens developed all of the innovations that they need within Africa, prior to leaving Africa. So we think these are very much African innovations. So what do we need to look for exactly? Well, if we look at the arc, the southern arc um, as uh, else here a helicopter. Um, anyway, so here's the, the southern arc 
um, showing Sundaland and Sahel, which are the continents that are exposed during the last glacial maximum, um, which would have been when hominin groups could have migrated across these landscapes. But the important thing is, uh, I want to show you here, is that um, we have sites that are over 40,000 years old um, that cover a range of different biomes. We have people living in grasslands, in temperate forests, tropical forests, and even proper true desert here in the center of Australia. And people do this remarkably quickly, um, adapting to these new environments. So how did people move out of Africa and what were the toolkits that they had with them? Well, let's look at um, Nia Cave just to see um, exactly how they coped with this new environment um, at about 46, 47,000 years ago. So human fossils and archeological material from this site shows that during this occupation period, the site was really a mosaic of humid rainforests and open woodlands. Um, but it was mostly densely forested and rapidly changing. Both would have caused um, real challenges for hunter-gatherers moving into this landscape. And so what we see here at the site is really diverse subsistence and technology remains. So this suggests that early modern foragers were able to meet the challenges of living in unfamiliar territory in a variety of ways. So at this site, we see evidence for mammal and fish trapping, the use of projectile technologies to access high canopy taxa, like birds and orangutans, um, evidence for tuber digging and shellfish collecting, as well as using plants that are toxic. So they must have been detoxifying these poisonous yams and nuts. And then we also find um, pollen from post-fire colonizers which indicates that they might have been using um, forest burning or niche construction in order to model their environment uh, to their advantage. So what this does is it reinforces a wider pattern that sets modern humans apart from earlier members of our genus. Now, the first to really suggest this was Clive Gamble, and he used the term adaptive plasticity. So what is that? What is adaptive plasticity? It's the ability to successfully colonize marginal environments. And by definition, um, we mean regions with low productivity or patchy and unpredictable resources. So as Gamble pointed out, uh, pre-sapien hominins, unlike our own species, were never able to colonize these hard habitats on a permanent basis. Although um, evidence from the Denisovians may be showing us um, that this may not be true, that they also lived at quite high altitude elevations. But more importantly, um, sites like Nia show how our modern ancestors were able to cope with these new adaptive problems. So in that case, they used sophisticated subsistence settlement strategies and a high degree of technical innovation. So they had planning depth and an overall adaptive plasticity so characteristic of our species um, in, our, in modern times. So um, it's this plasticity that would have surely required a deep pool of cultural knowledge and effective communication to facilitate rapid information flow across space and through generations. And the presence of adaptive flexible behaviors in some of the earliest sites outside of Africa combined with the sheer speed and apparent ease with which modern humans dispersed, suggests that modern humans possess the capacity for such plasticity um, well before they leave Africa 60,000 years ago. So if that's true, then when, where, and how, and under what conditions did this level of adaptive plasticity develop in Africa? Okay, so looking at the distribution of um, Middle Stone Age research um, in Southern Africa, we'll note that there's an ecological imbalance. And moreover, the distribution along the subcontinent's uh, coastal forelands seems to dominate research. And this is fair enough, this is probably where the primary human population centers were for Southern Africa. Um, but Southern Africa is a subcontinent of pronounced ecological variability 
with eight major and 11 minor smaller terrestrial biomes, many of which, most of which, are less productive and predictable than the south and eastern regions. So, in contrast, less sustained research has been conducted in these resource-poor areas that would have required the development of flexible, creative foraging solutions for their successful colonization and exploitation. So it's in areas like these that it's possible that relatively sophisticated cultural capacities may be expressed in other ways than those found on the coasts. So for example, through changes in the intensity of exploitation, uh, through changes in the distribution of social units across the landscape, or importantly, innovations in foraging or land use strategies, such as niche construction. So our um, research is targeting two such areas. Um, on the left, we're working in the Richtersfeld in northern Namaka land, which is actually the southern extension of the Namib desert. This is our dry land. And then to the east, we're working in the highlands of Lesotho. Um, this is the roof of southern Africa, and these are our highlands. So our two research regions have many similarities, but there are appreciable differences. Both are marginal in our defined sense of being generally less predictable and productive than the Cape. Um, they have patchy resource distributions, extreme diurnal and annual temperature fluctuations, and highly seasonal rainfall. And moreover, while Namakaland is an arid semi-desert shrubland that experiences extreme heat, uh, Lesotho is a high altitude grassland with up to 2,000 millimeters of rain recorded on the highest slopes where it also experiences the most extreme cold. So while both are relatively marginal today, they contrast significantly, uh, with Namakaland obviously being the more, or rather less hospitable region um, than Lesotho. Now, in addition to their ecological marginality, relative to the southern and eastern coastal forelands, we chose these two regions because they bookend the Orange Senku River Basin, which is the, long, the longest river uh, with the largest catchment basin south of the Zambezi. And we suspect that the Orange Senku was a highly significant geographical feature for Middle Stone Age populations living in the interior regions of Southern Africa. Specifically, it may have played a major role both as a persistent source of fresh water and aquatic resources, but also perhaps as a corridor or artery of population movements and communication. Now, this is because the river passes through extremely steep um, rainfall gradients on its nearly, where, here we go, from here, uh, nearly 2,000 kilometer trek from the highlands, uh, the headwaters in Lesotho, all the way across southern Africa to the, the mouth in the um, in Namakalan. So, thus, it's a highly productive uh, river, but it passes through extremely water stressed regions. Um, now, paleoclimate research has shown that the two rainfall zones here, on, showing here on the right, so this solid line depicts the extent of the winter rainfall zone, um, which is driven primarily by the westerlies coming from the west and um, bringing winter rain to this region, as opposed to the dashed line, which is showing the edge of the summer rainfall zone, which comes obviously in the summer and is dominated by the monsoon or su uh, summer rainfall zone um, precipitation bands. Now, paleoclimate research has shown that these two rainfall zones seem to be out of phase or out of sync in terms of humidity through time. So humid conditions will be present in one area while it's dry in the other and vice versa. So we're expecting to see um, contrasting relationship between evidence of occupation. So we expect to see uh, more robust or dense occupation in regions where it was wetter, um, and then the dry areas would be not abandoned, but less lightly visited. So our research areas are thus well placed to understand the role to see how, what role the river played in human lives as the climate and local environments changed. Okay, so these are the required photos of the sites that we've been working at, the rock shelters. 
Showing here on the left is Spitzkloof A and B, their twin rock shelters. Um, Spitzkloof A, we have not yet been able to date the basal layers. Uh, we're beyond the range of radiocarbon and our uh, OSL optically stimulated luminescence dates um, didn't work out. They were super saturated or came back as infinite. Um, but our excavations at B are producing much nicer stratigraphy um, with what seems to be better um, preservation. Here is Sahong Hong. Its basal date is about 58,000 years ago, right up until about 200 years ago, while an optically stimulated luminescence date at Metacani puts our base uh, deposit at 83,000, roughly to the late Holocene. And so, um, importantly, we have evidence for long-term occupation of these rock shelters that we can use to look for these innovations. Okay, so in a nutshell, our project is aimed at developing archaeological and paleoenvironmental records of challenging landscapes during the Pleistocene. Um, the data sets that we're producing serve as uh, counterpoints to the traditional hotbed of later Pleistocene research in Southern Africa, which is typically located along the southwestern continental margin. And our primary research question <laughs> is relatively modest in that we're trying to figure out where, when, and how, and in which environmental conditions uh, modern humans developed pronounced adaptive flexibility. And at the moment, we think that perhaps the best archaeological expression of this plasticity is inherently biogeographical, with the best examples um, being the widespread dispersals within Africa that eventually led to the rapid colonization of the old world and eventually the new world. So we're really interested in processes of colonization, landscape learning, uh, occupational pulsing, and cultural innovation that accompanies human movements into areas uh, that demand um, a high degree of flexibility. And Southern Africa is a really excellent place to conduct this research. First, because of the rich late Pleistocene archaeological record that's becoming increasingly well resolved. And secondly, because the subcontinent is extraordinarily diverse in terms of ecology, with no shortage of marginal areas um, that were eventually colonized. our sites. Okay, so now that I've introduced you to our project, we can return to the interesting question of what evidence do we have for social and technological innovation, and how does eggshell fit in this anyway? Now, it's actually quite remarkable because we have quite a lot of ostrich eggshell in the Namakwaland region and very little in the Lesotho region, and this is actually going to play an important role going forward through this talk. Um, so in semi-arid regions, like the majority of Southern Africa, ostriches are abundant. And while foragers don't really seem to be eating ostriches, they certainly do use the eggs for a whole range of different um, things, whether it's for creating beads or pendants, as well as flasks that we know were carrying um, not just water, but specularite and ochre. We find other materials being stored in these eggs. So analysis of the ostrich eggshells are important, not only because it can tell us about social or technological innovations, but it can also tell us about um, different cultural styles. And just as important, um, because it's an organic material, it can record local paleoenvironmental and geochemical signatures of the environment during egg formation. Okay, so this is important. So let's just spend one slide talking about egg formation. So, so ostriches, or Struthio camelus australis, are known to breed year round, but they peak during the rainy season. So eggshells form rather quickly, like normally within about 24 hours, and they're laid within three to five days. Um, so that means that they are recording an isotopic signature that reflects a very narrow uh, time period when that egg was formed. Um, ostriches have learned to tolerate quite arid conditions and they prefer to forage in open environments. So they're mixed feeders eating a variety of C3, C4 and CAM plants. Although they do tend to prefer um, tender foliage uh, if it's available. 
So we can use the robust eggshells to generate uh, radiocarbon dates, uh, paleoenvironmental isotope signals, and even geochemical signals of mobility and trade if we can account for contamination. And I'll talk about contamination a bit at the end. Okay, so how do we use ostrich eggshell in terms of radiocarbon dating? Well, this story actually begins with our very first foyer into our research project, which begins in 2008, uh, where we opened up an excavation at Metaconi Rock Shelter in Lesotho, shown here as a trench that opened beside the 1974 trench Pat Carter opened. So when we returned, our plan was to excavate um, stratigraphically and slowly and produce an, our new profile, which is here. Now, we were very lucky. We had abundant charcoal and really great preservation at Medicani. And so we were able to radiocarbon date um, at Oxford um, using advanced techniques. Um, a lot of the charcoal for the deposit. And at the very base of the deposit, we were able to use OSL. Zenobia Jacobs came and did the OSL um, here. So at the surface, you can see we have a Holocene deposit, um, a very small last glacial maximum 24,000 year ago deposit, a decent marine isotope stage three deposit ranging from 38 to 46,000, a fairly substantial deposit at 50,000, um, a house and support deposit at 61,000, and then of course our OSL dates tell us that our basal deposit is 83,000 years ago. Now what this tells us is we have, like we, we knew or predicted, there would be evidence of um, occupational pulsing in the region depending on when um, people were living in the, in the area. So what's important to remember going forward is that we have a very small LGM deposit and a fairly decent 50,000-year-old MIS-3 deposit. Now, when we started working in 2010 and 2011 at Spitzkloof, we didn't have as much luck in terms of the preservation of stratigraphy. Um, we had to excavate primarily as inclusions changed, and it was a lot more difficult to notice layer changes. And we also had very little organic preservation in terms of any um, plant material that we could um, radiocarbon date. Now, luckily, John Vogel had already worked out um, the calibration process for radiocarbon dating ostrich eggshell. And so um, we were lucky. Oh, sorry, I didn't even notice the flask monk. I'll show that in a second. So the one thing we do have at Spitzkloof is abundant ostrich eggshell. And it's no surprise, we're right in the semi-arid desert. And in fact, we see lots of ostriches when we're excavating at the site. So not only do we have um, plenty of ostrich eggshell throughout the deposit, we see it presenting in many different colors, including a lot of this teal color, orange, um, the deep reds that we see also down um, the west coast. We also see evidence for bead making throughout the deposit. We have every kind of bead preform stage you can imagine, different colors of beads, black, tan, natural. Um, we have lots of engraved and flask mouth uh, ostrich egg shells. So we have the whole gamut at Spitzkrieg. Now, the important thing here is, for example, these beads and these bead preforms come from this lovely orange deposit well below the surface, but without any kind of way of dating it, we have no idea how old they are. So we sent our samples to um, Dr. Paula Reimer at Queen's University Belfast, who, and we produced this beautiful uh, um, radiocarbon distribution. So at Spitzkloof, we have a massive post-LGM deposit from 17,000 to 19,000 years ago. It's almost 60 centimeters of deposit. And a very robust, very tightly dated um, LGM signal from 23.1 to 23.4 um, thousand years ago. And below that, we have, again, a quite a robust 51,000 years ago deposit. So. This was unexpected in that um, we did expect to see evidence of occupational pulsing, uh, just like we saw at Metaconi. But in this case, we actually have 
people living at both ends of the uh, of our river at the same time. And I'm not trying to say that it's the same people moving up and down the river all the way, but it's just interesting that at the same time, um, during periods of real environmental fluctuations, people were at both sites. But clearly, they had a preference for Namakawan during the last glacial maximum. Now, unfortunately, we don't have dates for any of these deposits because um, the OSL tubes were super saturated. And so for now, all we know is that it's beyond the limit of radiocarbon dating. Our dates came back at 59 plus thousand years ago. So going forward, I think the only way to really deal with this is going to be a whole new program where we again use the ostrich eggshell um, and we collect a column of ostrich eggshell where we radiocarbon date one half of a piece and then use um, uranium thorium dating to date the other half of the piece. So I've been in contact with the team at Berkeley who have been working on this and especially looking at um, contamination. So for example, Elizabeth Napolo and I um, sent emails to um, other members of her team to see if we can't get on top of this uh, issue. Okay, so we've talked about MEMSA and radiocarbon dating. Now I'll just share briefly um, some uh, preliminary paleoenvironmental proxy data, uh, specifically for vegetation. I'll present the biometrics and carbon results that were actually a master's project by my student, Sarah Cavisto. So the question she was trying to answer was, when we looked at the faunal analysis, actually I'll go back up one. When we looked at the faunal analysis, um, comparing the signal from the LGM layer to that 51,000 year ago layer, we saw that we had statistically very different environmental signals. So the fauna from the 23,000 year old deposit um, has these large water dependent grazers, zebra and red hartebeest, in addition to the local arid adapted species like the Hemsbach and the Springbok. But we also had a, a quite a range or an increase in diversity um, compared to normal sites. And in fact, we had um, up to 20 different taxa, including um, this homopus or mountain loving turtle. So we actually, tortoise, sorry. We, so we actually have three different tortoises at the site. Um, and also when we use the, um, it's called the mean undulate body mass index. It's just looking at what is the ratio of large animals to small animals. We see that that ratio says 48% of our animal species consist of these large undulates. And this is actually highly correlated to precipitation because they're, they're water obligate. So taken together, it suggests that, the, um, that during the LGM at 23,000 years ago, the signal, which is based on over 5,000 identified specimens, is indicating um, a wetter period than it is today. And just to note, when you look at the distribution or the frequency of the different animals that are present, you can see tortoises, while they are the most abundant, are not going to be contributing the most calories, um, but they do make an, an important contribution to this diet. Now, at 51,000 years ago, we see that forager diets are focused primarily on these small terrestrial um, territorial bobbits, um, species that are more easy to snare, as opposed to these large undulates. And in fact, we only find the local arid adapted Hemsbach in the 51,000 deposits, and our diversity of species drops a bit um, with only 17 different species. Again, looking at the proportion of the prey, so the undulates, the known prey animals, um, only 16% of the animals are large undulates. Now, again, with the entire faunal signature um, suggesting a semi-arid environment, it does look like at 51,000 years ago, we have an arid signal, very different from the 23,000. So our question is, is the presence of grazers during the LGM due to an increase in humidity or precipitation? 
Um, or are we seeing higher levels of mobility where people are bringing in pieces of animals from further afield? Because it's true that the majority of these um, large grazers are, are not whole carcasses, but in, indeed just pieces that have been schlepped to, to Spitzky. So to try and tease this apart, we can look at two different things. Um, first, we can test the paleoenvironmental indicators, and then we can test evidence for mobility. Okay, so in order to really understand what the results of our paleoenvironmental signals are, we need to understand what the mechanisms are for the potential increase of humidity or precipitation in the in the Muckleland during the last glacial maximum. So currently, um, winter rain uh, dominates the landscape as the westerlies move in and precipitate um, up to around this boundary. It actually ex it spills over further into this middle all year round zone. But one possibility is that we have an increase in the intensity of the westerlies, which forces this band up in, into Namibia uh, with an increase of precipitation. Another potential possibility is that um, because this is during the last glacial maximum and ice is being locked up at the poles, we all know that the shoreline would have dropped along the west coast and expanded by at least 20 kilometers from this coastline. And this may have acted as a buffer so that it prevents the intensity of the westerly upwelling cells and effectively allows the monsoon precipitation bands to penetrate into this region from the east. Now, if um, hypothesis number one is correct, we would expect to see an increase in our C3 vegetation signals, our winter rainfall signals. And if um, hypothesis two is correct, we'd expect to see an input of C4 grasses from the summer rainfall zone to the east. Okay, so C3 signal suggests either the maintenance of the current scenario or an increasing intensity, whereas C4 signal suggests that um, the summer rainfall zone is infiltrating. So the first thing I'll present, uh, because it's a little more robust in terms of data set, are the biometrics of the ostrich eggshell. So the biometrics of eggshell can be used as a paleoenvironmental proxy because there's a relationship between egg conductance and humidity. So if we look at the thickness of an ostrich eggshell throughout the deposit with a sample of over a thousand individuals, we should be able to see that overall there's really not that much of a shift. Okay, so the idea is that um, in arid environments, uh, shells become thicker and pores closed in order to protect the embryo. So when looking at our data set, all of these individual dots down here record much wetter periods. So I'm not saying that it's been um, a semi-arid environment constantly through time. We clearly do have signals that there was fluctuations and that there is period of greater um, humidity. But overall, was it enough <clears throat> to shift the environment um, in the ways that I was showing in the previous slide? Not really. The only statistically different group is actually this uh, 51,000 year ago group. Um, it's a robust set at over 100 samples. And it um, is slightly more arid than the other samples. Okay, so. There's a little bit of evidence that at least 51,000 years ago, the region was quite arid and probably a lot like the modern environment. Although overall, it looks like the, the rest of the deposit was too. Okay, now I don't want you to read too much into this because the sample sizes, as you can see here, are quite small, ranging from only three samples to 14. But the important thing is to note that the majority of our samples return values that are affiliated with a C3 ecosystem, whether it signals a bit more humidity or precipitation, or that it maintained a dry ecosystem, we don't really see any input from C4 grasses, which would be up here on the graph. Um, now, we don't wanna to put too much into this shape because 
with the addition of a greater sample size, we could easily flesh this out to be much more robust. Um, but it's also important to note that the hypothetical ostrich diet or of ostriches eating C3 plants would produce what is shown here in this yellow boundary, boundary box, okay, that it would range from about minus 24 parts per mil or per mil to about minus 30 per mil. And so these ostriches look completely normal for a C3 um, environment. Oh, and this research was also helped by Dr. Julie Lloyd at the um, archaeometry lab at UCT. So even though these are preliminary results, what does our data suggest? Well, the biometrics suggest very little change through time. And while the sample size of our paleoenvironmental isotopes is small, the preliminary data does suggest, um, while there is fluctuating evidence for humidity or precipitation in the sample, there's really no major change. There's no real input of C4 grasses into the um, samples. And so we're most likely seeing the maintenance of the winter rainfall zone. So we need to increase our sample size to actually determine whether or not we see an intensity of the winter rainfall zone or just um, muted environmental change. Okay, so what about mobility? So for Sarah Cavisto's, um, my master's student's um, project, she also looked at the strontium values or the strontium isotopes of those same ostrich eggshell fragments that I showed in the previous slide. Um, now, the thing about strontium isotope ratios um, is that <clears throat> the ratios of ostrich eggshell fragments reflect the bioavailable strontium in local rocks that's transferred to vegetation and water that's consumed by ostriches during the breeding season. And when these isotope ratios are sufficiently differentiated, we can actually use it to pinpoint where these nests might have been located. Now, assessing the geology of Namako land, well, I hope you can see that the majority of these rocks are at least sufficiently old for strontium analysis um, in that they date from about 2 billion to 500 million years old. Um, the, and ranging over here, if you look at these strontium values in a very basic um, isoscape or strontium map, um, believe me when I say that these are actually quite high values, which correspond to the ancientness of these rocks. Okay, so um, with sediment samples up along the Orange River, we have values ranging from 0 0.72 to 0 0.74, which reflect the age of the deposit. Um, we also have to be considerate of the fact that we're close to the coast and seawater has a very young strontium age at um, 0 0.709. And we must consider that any of the nests that were formed on the coast and even maybe upwards of 80 kilometers inward may have a, a coastal fog water input into the formation of the shell. So the thing about the geology in the Makaland is that it's such a um, active metamorphic province we have such an incredible mishmash of different ages uh, and therefore different strontium signals of the rock in the region, it's going to be impossible, nearly impossible to pinpoint where the nests come from in the area. But at least we can try and look at um, the local Spitzkluge Valley to determine if beads and or ostrich fragments are, are local or non-local. Okay, so here is the distribution of our same beads. Okay, focus here on the modern or local values. Oops. Um, hopefully you can see, well, it's hard to read off the graph, but I, I'll tell you that they range from 0 0.713 to 0 0.7148. And so we've expanded up this orange um, rectangle to show the local Spitzkuh Valley um, uh, strontium ratio. So the orange dots are um, ostrich egg shell fragments and the blue are beads that we used laser ablation so they're, they're not damaged in order to measure the strontium results. 
So in terms of our question about whether or not people were more mobile at 23,000 years ago, we can't really answer that because we don't have the sample size of the other deposits. So, so well, yes, we can say at the 23,000 years ago, we clearly see beads at the older end of the spectrum and even younger, um, as well as fragments coming from potentially these younger signals, which is likely coming from the coast or sea, where, where sea spray is influencing. Um, but what's but we don't really have a, a really good sample size for the 51,000 deposit. Oops, trigger happy. Um, I also wanted to point out that this blue bead is not an actual bead, but a preform. And it's one of the preforms I showed on the slide um, with the profile. So again, um, we clearly have evidence for people moving in and around the landscape. We just cannot pinpoint where these nests um, are located. Now, I think this would be an important place to point out that we have a really big issue with diagenesis. And again, I want to um, point out to the research of Elizabeth Neopolo and W.D. Sharp in trying to identify the contamination that may happen through the pores of ostrich eggshells. Um, so I've contacted um, Sharp to see how we could best improve this research and hopefully I'll hear back from them and we can go forward. So if there is major contamination on our samples, then we would expect it to reflect the, the local burial environment signal. So I just want to point out that all of these um, fragments that are presented within the modern or local range, and even this bead here, it could be contaminated. And in fact, they may not be local at all, um, but are from somewhere else, but are now presenting the local signal. So that's something we definitely have to deal with. Okay, and for my final um, discussion about ostrich eggshell and innovation, I'd like to present some results that we published. Um, it's a study led by Brian Stewart at Michigan called Ostrich Eggshell Bead Strontium Isotopes Reveal Persistent Macroscale Social Networking Across the Lake Quaternary in Southern Africa. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so as this is published, this is a little bit more formal and complex. But anyway, so how do we begin to trace such hypothesized long-term axes of human movement and social connectivity? So in Africa, research into hunter-gatherer later Stone Age social networks has been heavily influenced by the seminal work of Polly Weissner among the Jukwansi of the Northern Kalahari. Xaro is a delayed reciprocal gift exchange system practiced by Jukwan individuals in which the transfer of material culture is used to create and reaffirm bonds of friendship and mutual support. Ixaro gifts can be any non-food item, but the most preferred are those decorated with ostrich eggshell beadwork. So Weissner's research shows that Jute One individuals consistently express a desire to create Ixaro partnerships um, uh, with people from areas uh, where the inhabitants have ample and steady income so that food is available to support visitors during the long dry season. So in this way, Xaro relationships famously serve as a social method of pooling risk across a semi-arid landscape in order to buffer against local resource shortages caused by fluctuating resource availabilities. So exactly the sorts of um, uh, difficulties or adaptive flexibility that we're looking to find. So the widespread tradition of making beads from ostrich egg shell appears to have begun in the terminal Middle Stone Age of both East and Southern Africa. And acknowledging the role of ostrich egg shell beads in contemporary Kalahari exchange networks, previous research introduced this ethnography into LSA archaeology. So in the 90s, um, and actually in the 80s, Aaron Maisdell and Peter Mitchell noted that ostrich eggshell beads occur in regions of southeast southern Africa with almost no historic or modern records of ostriches being present on the landscape. Let me say that again, because it's important. 
they noted that ostrich eggshell beads occur in regions of southeastern southern Africa with almost no evidence of ostriches on the landscape, including higher Lesotho. Now, given their preference for relatively level semi-desert or desert habitats, it seemed to them that ostriches were not endemic to the extremely rugged and well-watered Maluti Drakensberg Mountains or the subtropical coastal belts of KwaZulu, KwaZulu Natal and Eastern Cape. They also pointed out that later Stone Age archaeological sites in these areas contained very little, I mean very little unworked ostrich egg shell fragments and virtually no debris of bead manufacturing. So this contrasts sharply with the rest of southernmost Africa, including the interior Karoo and Namakaland, where sites are typified by large assemblages of unworked ostrich eggshell fragments, beads, and bead manufacturing debris. So based on these observations, Mitchell hypothesized that ostrich eggshell beads from archaeological sites in the Maluti Drakensberg Mountains represent exotic items that were introduced via prehistoric exchange and interaction networks. <clears throat> okay, so developments in heavy isotope geochemistry over the decades since Mitchell proposed his hypothesis have made it possible to trace the source of ostrich egg shells. By conducting strontium isotope analysis on beads from archaeological sites in Highland Lesotho and comparing those values to background signatures from both the highlands and possible lowland source areas, we're able to test the first portion of Mitchell's hypothesis that the ostrich eggshell beads mainly represent exotic or non-local objects. However, the second portion of Mitchell's hypothesis is more challenging since determining whether an item was introduced via um, exchange or through direct procurement must be demonstrated rather than assumed. So to do that, we employ Bob Whalen's heuristic model shown here of band level hunter-gatherer territorial organization and social network sizes. So he drew on a range of ethnographic data to model a minimum band um, to be composed of 25 to 30 people with a forging radius of approximately 28 kilometers. He calculated that 19 such minimal band units could form a reproductively viable mesoscale social network with an expected territorial radius of about 123 kilometers. So this is equivalent to nearly the entire Maloti Drakensberg region itself. So Whalen notes that human mobility and interaction can also take place between adjacent mesoscale social networks, and that these networks can result in ethnographically documented movements up to 325 kilometers and were presumably established to ensure access to maximally diverse or stable resources to strengthen social safety nets. However, archaeological evidence from Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic Europe also suggests the existence in the past of material transfers over distances as far as a thousand kilometers. And Whalen suggests that non-utilitarian items of purely symbolic value, such as beads, would be a better indicator of long distance exchange and thus may signal the existence of a macro scale network. So in order to test the second portion of Mitchell's hypothesis, the beads in Highland Lesotho were obtained through, um, to see if they were obtained through prehistoric macro social networks, we hypothesized that their um, source should fall within a range of between 123 and 1,000 kilometers from, their, from our research area, from where they get deposited. All right. So unlike Namakulan, and completely the opposite to Namakulan, central and eastern southernmost Africa has excellent potential to conduct strontium tracing studies due to its geological structure, which as you can see here, roughly resembles a lopsided bullseye. Now, most of this region is covered by the Karoo supergroup. Um, and the highest and the youngest of this is the, shown here in yellow, is the Drakensberg basalts that form the Maluti Drakensberg Mountains. And below the Drakensberg is the older Stormberg sedimentary group, which is exposed in the deep valleys and areas immediately adjacent to the highlands, shown in pink. 
And below this are the increasingly old and extensive Beaufort and Eka and Dwika sedimentary groups, which cover the bulk of Southern Africa's interior um, plateau in various blues. So the increasing geographic size of successively lower, older bedrock units means that strontium ratios can be expected to significantly increase the further one moves away from the bullseye. Such geochemical differences provide ideal conditions in which to employ strontium as the means of exploring artifact proveniencing. We recall over here in Namakaland, um, the distribution of the metamorphic provinces were so chaotic that there was no ways we would really be able to identify nests. Now here we almost have the opposite um, in that we have enormous areas with the same signals. But I digress. So for this study, we used 27 beads from Metakani and um, Sahong Hong rock shelters. Both are in Highland Lesotho, and the levels span from um, for the past 30,000 years. High precision strontium isotope ratios were determined at the University of Michigan on a Finnegan MAT 262 solid source Tim's mass spectrometer. Dun, 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 the results. Our results are shown here as box plots with the beads represented by the white box plot to the far right. The isoscape values for successively older geological substrata of the Karoo supergroup are encountered as one moves left across the plot and color coded to the geological map above. Results show clearly that the strontium values of the Lesotho beads do not overlap with those of the Maliti Drakensberg heavily predominated geological stratum, the Drakensberg. Um, a two-tailed test, a two-tailed t-test indicates that the main strontium value of the US beads is significantly higher than that of the Highland Lesotho baseline or the local values. So moving out from the Highlands, the beads overlap with the next older and more expensive strata, the Stormberg and Beaufort groups, but only partly. And again, t-tests reveal the mean of the Lesotho beads is significantly higher than both. So in contrast, the structure of the bead data most resembles that of the outmost member of the Karoo supergroup, the Eka Dweka group. Supporting this is the insignificantly different t-test result obtained between their mean values. So viable ostrich habitats underlain by Eka Dweka geology occur no closer than 200 kilometers to the north and up to 900 kilometers to the west from Metakani and Sahong. In addition, two beads yielded even higher outlier values, uh, one of which is visible here on the white box plot and the other is not shown. So they must have originated from um, ge geological settings even more ancient than these ones, and maybe even over in Namaka. So we think our results are promising. Um, the statistically significant difference of the strontium variance between our highland beads and the highland background strontium signature indicates the beads are not local to the Maloti Drakensberg region. As for their possible source locations, um, the significantly similar mean values between beads and small mammals from areas underlain with Eka Dwika geology suggests that many of the beads actually came from a considerable distance, maybe 200 or greater than 500 kilometers away. So we argue that this furnishes evidence of long distance, macro scale social networks operating across these macro regions, perhaps similar to those documented ethnographically by Weissner in the Kalahari. The implication is that these networks stretch back in time at least 30,000 years, though whether they held the same purpose or meaning as they do for modern Kalahari San is open to question. And while understanding from where these, um, across these vast areas, these ornaments arrived will require considerably more work, we suggest that they were likely imported from at least the interior Karoo to the west. Our reasoning is based on landscape biogeography and the sharp resource contrasts between the well-watered Lesotho Highlands and the drier, more erratic interior Karoo. So future work will involve improving our understanding of contamination, improving isoscape baselines, isolating interaction spheres, charting diachronic network changes, undertaking interregional comparisons, and coordinating with other teams pursuing similar goals elsewhere on the subcontinent. 
So I would like to, first of all, acknowledge the various people that contributed um, time, effort, lab space to the um, results that I've just discussed. And our research was funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada and by a Michigan m funding program. Thank you. And are there any questions? Um, firstly, thank you so much for the talk. It was really insightful. Um, we currently have one question in the chat, um, but it was kind of like at the start of the talk. Okay. Um, Garrett asked, um, do we see any evidence of early agricultural, um, yeah, sorry, early agriculture and the communal architect, um, architecture that would support this? Early, of early agriculture in, um, sorry, Garrett, can you type it out again? Early agriculture where in South Africa? Um, currently, the question just says evidence of early agriculture and the communal architecture that would support this. Um, okay, so for Mokoland, um, early um, agriculture, no. We've never seen anything. In fact, really, even today, we don't really see much evidence for agriculture. It's primarily um, pastoralism that's um, present. And if you're asking about Lesotho, um, no, we haven't really seen evidence for early agriculture that I can think of. I mean, some of our surface deposits are potentially in the right time frame, but certainly not like we've seen in other parts of Lesotho, not um, in the highlands where we are. Cool. Um, I'm just checking to see if any further questions come in. Garrett said thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, um, oh, someone said, um, they'd love to know more about the, like, B dimensions and other indications of manufacture. Um, from Lesotho, uh, okay, so, um, that's a very good question. Uh, my PhD student, Courtney Hopper, I hope she's watching now. She's actually undergoing a major program of, uh, measuring all the beads, um, from our sites in order for us to also include that cultural style signifier as well within our greater deposit uh, or interpretations. And so that was part of what I meant in the very end in the conclusion is that um, we're also still trying to also look at other cultural innovations as well as style and um, yeah, associations through time. Um, he added, it's Andrew that asked, um, with, like, what are the patterns on the ostrich eggshell containers? Um, oh, okay. We have um, both... Hi, Andrew. Um, we have both um, parallel and chevron. So parallel ladder um, as well as chevron. If you send me an email, I can, I can send you some pictures. <laughs> Um, cool, yeah, so Andrew, if you drop us an email at info at ArcSoc, we can just forward it to Genevieve. Um, and then Garrett asked again, um, side question regarding the ostriches. Were they similar in size um, or were they like kind of like megafauna? Um, wow, that's a really good question. I think we assume that they would be similar in size, but the thing is we never really find ostrich bone. So what's really strange is, um, sorry, my thing's going around. Um, so while we do see people using every, we see ostrich egg shells being used for a myriad of different purposes, we never really see the ostrich bone itself being used. I mean, I think at most I've seen maybe five or six in total, and it's usually like a toe bone or something like that. So without actually having the material, we don't know, um, but that's a good question. We don't know. Um, I think that's it from the questions. Um, thank you once again, Genevieve. It's a really insightful talk. No um, yeah, and all the best with future research. Um, I'm sure everyone would like, love to hear about it again next week. Um, yeah. Fair enough. Okay, well, uh, not next, week, next, week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next week I'll be on an airplane coming there and um, <laughs> spending the next month in the in the highlands because we're going up to Hasselosia so pray for no snow because we're going to be living up there next week <laughs>
cool well thank you again um and thanks to everyone that joined um we really appreciate it and yeah you'll be able to find the talk again on our youtube channel see you next month i guess <laughs> bye